Welcome everyone to Coffee with a Codex. My name is Dot Porter and I am a curator in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Um, I, once a week, I go to the shelf. I, I don't really do it this way. I don't just go to the shelf and pick one. I actually have a schedule. Uh, but I take out a book and we do an informal show and tell about 30 minutes. Uh, worth over Zoom. So you all can have a chance to see some of these books that we have in our collection. And uh, I am joined by Amy Hutchins, who is there on Zoom. She will be watching the chat. I'll be watching the chat. If you have questions as we go, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll answer. Um, if, on the other hand, if you know a lot about herbals, we would love your input. So don't be shy about sharing your knowledge uh, as we go. Because I, as I like to make clear, I am not a, um, a specialist in herbals specifically. I'm a manuscript scholar. I'm very interested in books, um, but I don't always know the content. So I'm going by what we have in, in the records, which isn't always um, right. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. Today we are looking at LJS 46. LJS 46 is a 15th century herbal. Um, partially made in Italy and partially made in England, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that, what that means. The binding is from, I want to say, or I got to get the, let me find the record here. The binding is later. The binding is about 100 years later, so I want to say it is, yeah, so like 17th century. What the record said is, says is that the binding is contemporary with the later texts. So let me, let me say for a minute uh, what this means. So the first part of the book, as it survives to us, is, is the herbal proper. And so every page has these uh, sort of wash drawings, paintings, of plants. And I'll say more about these in a minute. We'll look more closely at them. So that's the first half. And then the second half of the book is texts that were written later, about 100 years after, um, in English. And also, I think there's English, Latin, and Spanish, but the record says it was written in England. And it's about Morocco. So this is one of the or the earliest descriptions of Morocco in England. Um, I was looking in um, some, some additional material that we have about this book, and the context of that is that the first trade with Morocco um, and England was in 1550. That was sort of the first documented uh, example of trade, and then after that it was sort of set up. And so this being within the like 100 years after that. Um, so this is very interesting in a, um, in a historical way. And these two pieces were bound together um, around the time, or I guess I should say pretty soon after the second part was written. So mid 17th century. Um, and it is interesting and you could say, well, why? Were they bound together? Well, part of what is documented in the in the information about um, Morocco is there is a lot of detail about the land and about the plants, flora, fauna, these kinds of things. So, looking at it that way, it sort of makes sense that you you know you can imagine maybe somebody having these two pieces. We've got well, we've got flora and fauna of Morocco being described, and then we have this herbal. So let's put them together because in a topical way, they kind of fit. Um, they don't fit physically. You can see here that the, the section about Morocco is uh, a little shorter. Um, so it doesn't exactly fit. Uh, I'm glad that they didn't trim it. Sometimes you would expect to see that they would actually cut this to make it fit, but instead they just put it all in this sort of larger binding. Um, the binding is uh, parchment, and it's kind of interesting um, from a perspective of provenance because you can see that there is a 
kind of gilded stamp that's there in the middle of this parchment binding. This is a family crest. It is the uh, crest of the Lancashire family of Latham. So it makes sense to argue, there's an argument to be made, that this is the family then that owned the book at the time it was bound. It was very um, a, you know, common practice to put your family crest on the book. It's one of the ways that we can track who uh, oh oh Linda here is from Lancashire so if you look up if you look up the um, oh it's the Lancashire family of Latham I don't actually know how how connected they are but um, but there you go so that's a clue as to ownership I also want to mention I was pleased uh, to see when I was looking at the provenance that this this manuscript it has an LJS shelf mark. We can see it here. LJS means that it was part of the Lawrence J. Schoenberg collection. So uh, Schoenberg, uh, Larry Schoenberg collected the manuscript and he gave it to Penn, but he actually gave it to Penn in honor of one of my colleagues, uh, Lynn Bransom, who is our Sims curator of programs. Um, and at the time that this was given to us, it was uh, 2012, and she was the uh, director of the um, Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts and had been for quite some time. So that was really interesting to see and nice to see. Okay, so here we are at the, um, at the start. You can see one of the things that you're gonna notice as we go through and look at these plants is that they are what you might call fantastical. Uh, the plants don't look like, it doesn't look like somebody took this book out in the woods and looked at plants and, um, and copied them. Uh, and in fact, they didn't. What these plants are based on is a Greek uh, manuscript called De Re Medica. Um, oh, sorry, no, De Materia Medica um, that was by uh, Dioscorides. So this was an older um, an older manuscript. This particular copy, however, was um, recovered. It's a, I'm reading from the from the archive record now. Uh, recovered from the sack of Constantinople in the mid 15th century, and instantly became famous in the West. So this manuscript popped up, and people started copying it. And so um, we've got the plants themselves, and then we have the names of the plants in Latin at the top. Now these look one might say, I might say that, a little bit more realistic. The, this looks like a leaf that you might actually see growing and there's some kind of seed pod maybe and this. These drawings here are contemporary with the second half of the manuscript. So when the manuscript was bound, this page, which is basically a fly leaf, um, was either, it looks like it was maybe even part of it because you can see it's shorter. Um, so this kind of got put inside this other thing. So that's kind, of, um, that's kind of interesting, this compiled book. So let's take a look through um, this. Uh, it is on paper, um, and it's a little, you know, it's a little bit messy. It's not the most beautiful manuscript you'll see. Um, it, the colors are mostly, it's mostly going to be brown and red and green. So already here we've got the brown and some of this sort of orangey red and green. And if we look here, and if you look carefully as we go through, um, we're gonna see faces. So someone, I don't really have a sense of when the faces were put in, if they were added later, or if they were part of the original design. Uh, we have another herbal uh, LJS 419, which is a little bit earlier, and it also has lots of little faces. So it was definitely a thing. Um, oh, Linda says mandrake. We will see a mandrake. That was not a mandrake. That was just a little, a little guy with his face in the, in the roots. Um, Let's see, oh, I'm, uh, let's see. Eagle and child motif has shown has gained niche significance beyond its use as a family crest. Yeah, there's a pub in Oxford that is the eagle and child. So that was a sort of popular uh, one. Let's see. So some of these 
I wish I had the other manuscript with me because this is a this is a plant that I recognize uh, from LJS 419. You can imagine that this is pretty <laughs> distinctive, not really looking like a real plant, but um, but I suppose they are real plants. Um, I think there's a whole practice of sort of figuring out which plants are um, actual plants versus uh, this one. I'm just noticing if we see here, do you see this up here on the edge? What's happening here is I just, I said something about how it was nice that the book wasn't trimmed. And now I feel like I have to take that back because this book was trimmed at some point. However, the person who did the trimming, trimming just means it was sort of cut around the edges. They didn't want to um, cut the plant off, so they cut around it. Let's see if we can do this. Here we go. They cut around it and then folded it over to save, to save the edge, um, which not enough, not enough people did, but they, they did that. So that's actually kind of nice. Um, but I think for most of the book, it didn't, it didn't actually cut um, thing. So Joyce says, Googling the Latin names will tell you what they actually are in some cases, but in some cases, I can't speak for this one. I will tell you, we've been doing, a, I've been working on a project with some other people on the other manuscript. And sometimes the names are just, are only, or maybe they've been miscopied or it's a completely imaginary plant and it's not nobody or people are arguing about what it what it actually is so it's not a clear one-to-one -one, um uh one-to-one -one from from that i think and i also think the um the the practice of naming plants by their latin sort of uh, scientific names is also later um, so I know that there was a lot of work. My, my dad is a botanist, so I kind of, this is how I know some of this, um, that uh, there was a lot of naming that happened in the 18th century. Okay, we're getting even more interesting. So here we have a little dragon here. And my assumption would be that the dragon has some kind of, is making some kind of commentary on this particular plant. I cannot... I don't know if uh, Amy has an idea of what that might, what that word might be, um, but sometimes when you see things like that, the name implies has some sort of dragon uh, implication. And then over here, this is actually a really nice opening because here we have lots of little faces, um, not only in the roots but also uh, up in the up in the leaves, including this. I love this guy up here. He doesn't look particularly happy but they have little personalities in their, uh, in their, in their faces, which is, which is kind of fun. And I kind of wonder what the artist was going for. Here's the mandrake. So if you all, I'm sure you all have heard of the mandrake. The mandrake is this plant that has a kind of a homo nucleus, I guess is what you call it, little man-shaped root and when you pull when you pull a mandrake when you pull one out of the ground you have to use a dog uh, to do it it's interesting that the dog is around the feet and not the sort of up here since that's where you're presumably pulling but whatever because when the mandrake gets pulled out of the ground it screams and it can make you insane and so over here he's covering his ears so he won't hear the mandrake screaming and the dog if you can see the dog's face this dog is about to go crazy because um, that Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus developed the Latin bio, binomial naming system, yes. Uh, thank you. So, so there we go, uh, Mandrake. And I'm betting that a lot of you know about Mandrakes because of uh, Harry Potter, because I think that book and movie really uh, popularized it. All right. We have more faces. Here's a guy over here. I like him very much. Um, and here there are some hands. And I think 
given the positioning of those hands, I think maybe it's flowers that are shaped like hands, because you see they're kind of coming up out of there. There will be more hands later. Hands seem to be a thing, hands and faces. Um, there. And then just these weird, there's a lot of these kind of weird tube-like um, ones, and then these that always make me think of like coming down from outer space like little aliens. But all right, uh, Paola, do we know who created this person culture and what was the purpose of the drawings? Yeah, so Amy's sharing the, the record. Oh, that's the Latham record. So Amy just put a record of the Latham family in there. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's a 16th century herbal. So the plants are, um, are copied from De Re Medica, which was, as the name of that, of, of it implies, it's a medical, um, so it would have, the original manuscript is accompanied by text that is essentially saying, here is this plant and here's how you use it in medicine. This manuscript, the only, the only text in this section is the names at the top. So we don't have this kind of, medical um, medical information. As I go through, you'll also see um, on this side, there was one a little bit earlier too, um, kind of pencil drawings, which I think were added later, um, but I'm not entirely sure. It could have been unfinished, um, unfinished ones. But most of them that are finished um, have, been, have been painted. Here's another one of these that has been, um, when it was trimmed, they didn't, they didn't, they cut around it. So that's kind of nice to see and a little unusual to see too. It shows a, a certain amount of care. I feel like that the person who was doing it cared about what was on the text and not just the fact of having the book. Um, and ironically, we see a lot of, um, really beautiful illuminated manuscripts that end up getting chopped on the edges. Um, oh, here's another, here's another dragon. Let's see, Lynn asks, could the hands and faces have some relevance to the Galenic system of signatures showing plants that had healing properties? Oh, that is, you know what, that is a really good, um, that is a good theory. And if we get our edition of LJS 419 done, we could probably answer that because we can note which, which ones that have healing properties also have faces. Here's something that's a little bit different. It looks like birds or something with tongues or maybe they're swallowing something. Um, they're just really, they're so fascinating, these, these, uh, drawings are really interesting. Okay, oh, there we go. I was gonna say, I like this guy, because he looks like he's running, sort of running back towards the back of the page. Um, the Lunaria, just shown, is recognizable today. Which one is Lunaria? Let's see if we can find it. Um, there's great conversation happening right now, by the way, and the, oh, I'm not sure where where Lunaria is, I think I switched by it. But there was a plant that was just rec somebody recognized uh, in the book, so, so that's good. I like this one. And actually, I recognize this from the other book, too. Um, so definitely being copied from the same, you know, um, maybe not the same whole book, but bits and pieces got copied. It's like with any kind of manuscript copying, things get copied, copied, copied. There is a kind of interesting thing happening here. If you see that, it looks like, so this is, this is a, a bookworm hole. So some kind, some egg or something got, uh, got laid in here, some kind of insect and it, hatched and, and took a snack. So there's just this little bit here in the, here in the center um, where that, where that kind of happened. 
which is kind of interesting to see. Usually I see it on the edges. Oop, more little faces, little pink faces. There's a little geogra ge uh, geometrical, and somebody wanted to draw something else on the page and sort of did it a little bit. Oh, you can't see that, hold on. There we go, somebody made a little sketch. Okay. And here is some plant. I don't know if we know what that plant is. I'm not even sure if that's in the record, um, but somebody stuck some leaves in there, so we keep it there. Um, here's another fold. Oh, this is for this side. Here's another fold out. I think, I'm not sure what's happening here. Oh, right on the edge, another plant that got folded over. And I, ha I don't think I've mentioned, but all this, this manuscript has been digitized. So if you go to the record, you can see uh, links to the facsimile. Um, okay, Lynn has something interesting to say here. Uh, she was talking about signatures earlier, and she says signatures was the theory that a plant that looked like a part of the body would be good for healing diseases of that part. For example, lungwort, pulmonaria has blotched leaves like a diseased lung. There are lots of similarly named plants showing their use in medieval and later herbal medicine. That is absolutely fascinating. And I would not be surprised at all if there were examples of that here, if we had just had more, a little more information about them. And here is I am not entirely sure what's going on here, but it looks like there's a tiny little dog there. Um, grass, I don't know. More faces. Here's another plant that is only outlined and not painted. Here is um, another leaf. It looks like this is almost, this has been like stuck there. So that isn't going anywhere. All right, and then we get to the end of that. And then we get the section, here's the section about Morocco um, and England. And it has its own drawings. So here is some kind of plant, um, Moroccan uh, plant there. And the sections, let me find my information about, uh, because this, this, is, this part is divided into sections. So it starts with notes on the plants of Morocco and their uses. Um, so, but this, 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 what is that? I don't, I don't know, I was hoping there'd be a description. So somebody, this, it looks like this was like a working document because it's been divided into these groups and we have a header and then descriptions, which I'm going to assume is, um, you know, here, here are all the plants and as I come across a plant, I'm going to, I'm going to note them. I'm also going to point out um, that I, I think you can see it, that there are folds this, this paper has been folded this way, so it's been folded down the middle and then folded again. So to make it in sort of long and narrow, let's say something that could be put into a bag. So this was, before it was bound like this, it was actually being, I'm going to imagine, it was actually being carried by someone who had it folded up and was um, writing in it as, as, as they went. And we can see there's like different um, different writing periods because we have different ink here. So this ink is a very different ink from that up here and it's like maybe he added a little note um, there. Let's see. And then the next section, I think that's where we are here. Um, 
names of cities, towns, and mountains in the provinces of Fez, Tremecan, and Tunis. So is that where we are? The numbering, the numbering is not great, but somewhere there will be, it looks like the numbering restarted. I don't think this has been refoliated. Um, but I think that that's what that section is. And then after the lists of uh, names of towns, there is another text. Um, there is, what's the Indian fig? Maybe we're still in this, you know what? We're still in the plant section. I got ahead of myself. Um, so let's keep moving see what more we can see. Simples of herbs, I'm just reading this up here. Simples of herbs found in Barbary, which is part of Morocco. Um, simples are a kind of medical, I think, it's like medical um, recipes that are a single thing or very simple, like that's why they're called simples. Um, yeah, Joyce says simples and herbs are sort of synonymous. That's what I thought. So here we have um, simples of herbs listed here, so found in Morocco. So this is somebody who's interested in these um, for medical reasons. So here is, here we are, here's the Reno des, um, Right, Fez, Tremecan, and Tunis. I think that's where we are now. So these are the lists of uh, cities, towns, and mountains. And then here is a text uh, called Reino de Morecos, which is in, so this is written in Spanish, I believe. And this could be copied. He could be copying it from someone else, or he could be, um, it could be something that he's written. I don't, uh, not really clear from the record. And then more descriptions of the region of Morocco. There's some blank, blank pages, so they didn't use it all. Yes, here we have the region of Morocco, so more descriptions of that. And then, let's see, province, Propinica. let's see, more descriptions. <coughs> so this is, this is, um, this, how this section was put together. And I would love to know if the person who, you know, wrote, I like to imagine, this is all speculative, but like he goes to Morocco and he travels around and writes all this down and then comes home. Maybe he bought the herbal, the Italian herbal part um, while he was, um, while he was traveling and then he comes home to England and has it bound together as sort of, you know, this, you know, memories of his travels in, in Morocco. And, you know, Spain, as uh, Linda points out, Morocco isn't very far from Spain. It's just over the, uh, just across the Mediterranean. So, and the fact that he's writing in Spanish, um, you know, indicates that he knows that language well. Um, unless he's copying something that's in Spanish, I guess. Um, so it is 12.30. So I'm going to uh, put this up and say thank you all so much. Um, if you want to look at this later, I do encourage you to go to the record and look at the facsimile. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. And uh, we'll be back next Thursday. And I hope you all have a wonderful week. And uh, I'll see you later. Bye.